Last Tuesday, our building was filled with worshipers and praisers and echoing back to heaven the truth that we have been told. I, I can't imagine a better gift to give God than that this season. Uh, we're continuing our uh, series this morning, Lessons from the Wise, and we're focusing our entire month of December on the lessons we learn from the Magi or from the wise men in the Christmas story. We're in Matthew chapter 2, and it said Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. I think the Christmas story exposes our need for guidance. Everyone needs it, the wise realize it, and they receive it. It's not just the male of the species that refuses to act for, ask for directions, common to popular opinion. Uh, it, it is actually a human trait. We don't like to acknowledge that we don't know where we are or where we are going or how we are going to give, get there. It really helps us focus on two essential qualities that you and I need if we're going to be open to receiving guidance from God. And the first is humility. It's humbling to admit you don't know the next step to take or even the sense of direction you should be going in. Jesus was constantly reminding us that we needed to become like a child. And a child is very open to asking for help and for direction. Uh, we probably know that we need guidance when we don't know where to go, but it's amazing how often we assume we know where to go and we assume we know how to get there and therefore we don't seek guidance. The wisdom of Scripture indicates that seeking guidance can be a daily pursuit, not just an occasional pursuit. It's wise to seek guidance daily. In fact, in the Lord's Prayer, right? Lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So some people worry about that. If, if I open myself to God's guidance, who knows what he'll have me do today or tomorrow or the next day. But what you should know is God is actually not capricious. He, he doesn't change his mind day to day. He leads us on a path that is absolutely essential for the growth and development of who he has created us to be. Second thing you really need in addition to humility is courage. We need courage because when you start seeking God's guidance, it's going to take courage to go to the places that he calls you to, to take the steps that he provides to you. Uh, we often look at ways to make our life easier, and that's the guidance that we seek. But God hasn't come to guide us to an easy life. He's come to guide us to a meaningful life. And there's a lot of difference between those two things. And so God will lead you to places that you would rather ignore or avoid. And it takes courage to pursue that. And the Bible has stories of people who both ran from the guidance of God and who sought the guidance of God. And we can learn a lot from those stories. The truth is, is that we need God's guidance in our lives because we are frequently lost. We are often afraid. We are frequently focused on something that will make us feel good but not actually make us any better. And so we need God's guidance in our lives. You've probably heard this expression. It's common in our culture. It, the expression is being in the right place at the right time. Yeah, you've heard that expression. And the assumption is, if I can be at the right time, at the right coordinates, then my life just works. Isn't that wonderful? Like, if I could just be in the right place at the right time. Um, 
The truth is that's kind of a string of fatalism that runs through our thoughts. That if I could just be at a right place, right time, everything works. But what if you're at the right place at the right time, but you're not yet the right person? How does that work? The guidance of God is far more than coordinates on a map or an appointment on a calendar. It has to, grow with the growth, has to do with the growth and development of who God is calling us to be, not just where he's calling us to be. And the guidance of God develops those capacities so that when we get to the right place at the right time, we're the right person for that experience. So it's not just about location. It's about growing. And uh, there are lessons we need to learn. There are skills we need to develop. There are our spiritual and emotional muscles that need to mature. And so we have a lot of guidance that is required in our lives. Wise people understand this need for guidance, and they lean into it. So the story in Scripture that we read through is uh, a story about magi from the East, and we know that uh, they've been exposed to an ancient sacred text in Numbers 24, where it told them that there would be a star that would arise in the heavens and it would signal the birth of the Messiah. And so not only were they aware of that information, but when they saw an anomaly in the heavens, they put two and two together and they began a journey. But to their surprise, the star didn't fill in all the information that they needed. I mean, we kind of wish we had stars too. Like, wouldn't it be cool to have a star that told you which college to go to? Or a star that told you which house to buy? Or a star that told you which person to marry. No takers on the person to marry thing. That was interesting. <laughs> it got really, really quiet. I can see by the star over your head that you're the right one for me. That just probably won't work. Uh, but the, the information can be incredibly complete. So even if you knew the college, what major are you supposed to take? Even if you knew the home, when are you supposed to buy it? At what interest rate? For what amount? Even if you knew the right person, will you be the right person when you walk down the aisle? Because the assumption is if I can just find the right person, <laughs> everything will be fine. I know lots of people who married up and it didn't work. And it's because they didn't grow. And so stars provide important information, but not complete information. And that means that we need some additional information. Now, when, it talk, when we talk about guidance, there's a lot of people who get uncomfortable with the whole concept that God can provide guidance in a person's life. Uh, they get really uncomfortable, mostly because they heard someone who did something really stupid, and they blamed God for it. Has anybody ever heard the expression, God told me? Uh, we, we, I call that the GTM card. They play the GTM card. God told me. And usually what's really fascinating is God told me to tell you. Because <laughs> you weren't listening to him. And now that's so God, God told me. And we get uncomfortable because people blame some of their most foolish choices on God. It really wasn't God that led them to that. So the choice is not choosing between kind of a spiritual investment in our lives that God whispers to us versus Scripture. It's learning to bring both together. Without Scripture, we really will have difficulty recognizing God's voice. Scripture is where we're trained to hear His voice. But without the supernatural, we'll tend to reduce Scripture to something that doesn't help us serve and love others, but rather target them. We see it in the Christmas story, right? I mean, the wise people received the star and the scripture, and they wind up worshiping the Christ child. But Herod, all he hears is the scripture, and he uses that scripture to target someone. There's a tendency in our culture to try to find sacred texts so that you can, you can root out the individuals that are unworthy in our culture and in our society and target them in some way. See, they're, they're the bad ones. That, that's not the purpose of scripture, ever. That's a misuse of it. And so there are some people who use Scripture to target. There are other people who just, they think the knowing is the only thing. We see that in the, in the chief priests and, and the teachers of the law, right? They know the location. It's Bethlehem. They've been told. Do they go? No. For them, it's enough to know. That's what the Scripture says. I know it. And they wind up missing out on that connection with God. 
So we need both of these things in our lives. So how does God use Scripture to guide us? How does God use Scripture to guide us? And the first is he teaches us priorities in Scripture. He teaches us priorities in Scripture. In Matthew chapter 6, it says, Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these other things will be given to you as well. You start with seeking God, his kingdom. Or in Matthew 22, a person comes to Jesus and says, which is the greatest commandment? What is he asking? What's the highest priority? And Jesus responds, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Or you can go back to the the, uh, to the law in Exodus, you should have no other gods before me. Every time we put something before God, we wind up losing our way. It's just what happens. We tend to use people rather than serve them. And we don't just bend and break rules. We bend and break ourselves and others when we start putting something or someone in the place of God in our lives. So scripture reveals to us principles. It also reveals, or it does reveal principles. So priorities, principles. Now, some people try to reduce Scripture to just history and rules. Don't get me wrong. The history is accurate and the rules are important, but that's not all Scripture teaches. It contains principles. And principles help us know how to recognize something when we see it and how to respond in an appropriate way. I'm fascinated right now. I've got a little granddaughter. Her name is Anna Rose, and they have a cat. Now, personally, I'm not a cat person. Don't judge me for that. Um, I, I said that one time, and I had a person standing with a sign at that door when I walked out of it. I won't tell you what the sign said, <laughs> but let's just say they were pro-cat. <clears throat> and uh, But it's interesting, cats and dogs... Both have fur, four legs, and tails. But you never confuse one for the other, do you? Why? You just know a cat is a cat, even if it's big and got hair all over its head. You know, well, that's a big cat. It's a lion, but it's a cat. Right? You just, how do you know that? Well, you kind of learn the principle of the cat. And the principle that you just recognize it when you see it. There are things that Scripture teaches us to recognize when we see it in life. There are principles that Scripture teaches us that when we operate by them, our life actually works better. For example, the, the principle of it is better to give than to receive. Why do we do that? Why, why do we wrap up a bunch of presents and, and, and put them under trees? Do you know that the, the whole concept of gift giving actually began with the wise men in the Christmas story. There, there's something incredibly releasing and fulfilling when we exercise generosity. Look at what it says in 1 Chronicles 29. David says, Who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you. And what we have given, uh, and, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. When we give... It actually allows us to make a change in our world while experiencing change in our heart. That's the only thing that accomplishes that. When we hoard and we hold on to and we withhold and we withdraw, we don't change and our world doesn't change. Uh, there are great stories in the Bible about people who hoarded and held back and what happened. And there are great stories in the Bible about people who exercised sacrificial generosity and what happened. So we just, it's a principle of, of generosity. It's a principle of forgiving. Forgiving is the only way I know to actually experience healing from the pain of the past. Some of us have been waiting for the person who hurt us to acknowledge that what they did was wrong. They don't need to acknowledge it. You can acknowledge it. Let's, let's just say, let's try this together. Right? We're going to say something together. We're going to say, that was wrong. You ready? Let's try it. That was wrong. Very powerful words. Because what it acknowledges is that you realize that that went out of bounds and you were not deserving of that. And it doesn't matter whether they ask for your forgiveness. You can still grant it. You don't need their permission to get on with your life. When we don't forgive, we're not releasing them. We're releasing us. 
That's a really good lesson. Forgiveness is not about trusting them. Forgiveness is not about pretending it didn't happen. You might not be able to trust them, and you might not be able to forget that it happened, but you don't have to be trapped in the past. It's so often you run into people, and they're standing right in front of you, but in a very real way, they're living in the past. Some brokenness, some injury, some pain that they experience, and they're trapped. Uh, they're, by the way, they're, they're relatively easy to spot in life. Unfortunately, this is true, but they're relatively easy to spot in life. Has anybody here ever had a really bad sunburn? Yeah. And somebody comes up and they just slap you on the back. How do you feel about that? You just, you know, you just, you go, hey! you, you just, you let them know, just, what are you doing? So, what, what? I got a sunburn. You say, I'm sorry, I didn't know. You're wearing a shirt. Who can tell? <laughs> and you know what happens if it's a really bad sunburn? There's a way you start positioning your body around people. You know, they'll come up and they'll just... <laughs> <laughs> and people look at you like, well, what's going on with them? And what you've got is a pain that someone else didn't cause, but they can make it feel like it, they did. And some of us carry those burns all of our lives. And we're positioning ourselves in our interactions with people based on something that injured us and burned us in the past. And that needs to heal. And the only way I know for that to heal is through forgiveness. It's a principle. It's a principle. That when we forgive, it releases us unto the full life that God intends for us. Our ignorance of Scripture actually keeps us from benefiting from the wisdom of those who have gone before us. We learn a lot through this process. So, Scripture, God uses the Scripture to guide us by teaching us priority, by teaching us principles, but also by making promises. Scripture contains incredible promises that God has made. And in 1 Peter, it tells us this, His divine power, God's power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Now look at this. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you might participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through evil desires. That there are some things that the promises of God actually help us participate in and escape from. These promises are not based on our goodness, but his goodness. God does not make promises to us because we are good. God makes promises to us because he is good. And by the way, that's the same reason he keeps his promises. He's not looking for a loophole to go back on his word. He wants to keep his promises to us. So when God's promises, when we are exposed to them, when we become aware of them, it provides a sense of hope, and it gives us a picture of what life can be rather than often what we settle for and what we have to endure. So God uses Scripture to reveal to us his promises. And then the last point is this, is that God uses Scripture to guide us by clarifying promptings, by clarifying promptings. Uh, what do I mean by promptings? Uh, probably the easiest way to describe it, uh, uh, I'm sure this has happened to you, where you're facing a challenge or a situation, and then you get this insight. Has this ever happened to you? You get an insight, and then suddenly you understand what's really going on. Oh, that's what it is. And then you can kind of course correct or, or approach the situation a little bit different, and you actually find out things work a little bit better. Just that insight, there's something going on beneath the surface, and I wasn't aware of it, and that's why this was so confusing. And now that I see what that is, I gain a lot of clarity. So God can actually help us gain insight to understand what's going on within us or in the world around us. There's another thing that God uses, and it's a concept of, of, of like intuition, Intuition. I'm not talking about a superstitious kind of thing, but intuition. You just, 
it helps you to kind of prepare for something or position yourself for something that's about to happen. I've got a really unusual story about this. I was uh, visiting someone who lived way out in the country, and in fact, the house that they lived in had just uh, a dirt and gravel road to get there. There was no pavement, and there was no street lights, and it was a dark night, and, and the moon wasn't shining, and I'm just driving along probably a little faster than I should have been, and, and so I'm driving along, and the thought occurred to me, and the thought was, if a deer jumped out right now and you slammed on the brakes, what would your car do on this gravel? And I thought to myself, I don't know, but there's nobody else out here. Why don't I just find out? And so I slammed on the brakes, and right after I slammed down the brakes, a deer jumped out in front of me. And I missed him because I started breaking him before I saw him. And uh, so someone says, oh, are you saying that if I'm a Christian, I won't hit any deer? <laughs> I'm not saying that at all. Um, are you saying that that was God? I don't know if it was God, but I'm willing to give him credit for it. Are you saying if I hit a deer that I'm a bad person? The deer would say that, but I would not. I just, <laughs> not going there. So, kind of an intuition. And here's the challenge, is that when we have these insights and intuitions, we have to learn how to submit them to Scripture. Because not all of our insights are accurate, and not all of our intuitions are based on reality. Uh, for example, a person can go through a very difficult season in life, maybe just a horrible relationship uh, scenario, and they can come out at the other end, and, and they've got an insight now. And so I'll tell you what, I learned a lesson. And I always, when people say, I learned a lesson, I always ask them, what was the lesson they learned? And I've had people tell me, what I've learned is, you can't trust anybody. <laughs> and that is not an accurate insight. What is true is there are some people in this world you can't trust and shouldn't, and there are some people in this world that you can trust and should, and Scripture actually helps give us wisdom to be able to discern the difference. You will destroy your life as much by trusting no one as you will by trusting everyone. And so we have to submit these insights. We have to submit these intuitions to Scripture. You know? uh, the, if we don't do that, we wind up missing out on some of the really good things that God has for us. So we bring that to Scripture. What does Scripture actually have to say about that? So we submit them. Not all of our insights are accurate. Not all of our intuitions are helpful. Sometimes we're just responding out of fear. Not all of our motives are pure. And so when we bring these things and submit them to Scripture, that's where we begin to clarify these promptings. Now, we need the wisdom of Scripture to help sort out our thoughts, our heart, to help us make sense of our world. And there's a lot of people who are interested in the spiritual, but what they really, a common motivator is so I can get what I want. If I can learn how to make these spiritual forces work the way I want, I can get what I want. And what I can tell you is there's not a few people in our world who got what they wanted and they're not satisfied and they're not fulfilled. Because using God is not the same thing as seeking God. And seeking his guidance is not just to get what we want, but to find out what he wants for us and for our lives. It's not like flipping a coin or entering coordinates in a GPS. Something much more than that. When it comes to receiving promptings from God, the question I have is, are you open to that? Does your model of following God allow for the capacity that he could give you a thought, an insight, or an intuition that would actually help navigate life? And when you have those, are you willing to submit them to Scripture? Are you balancing the wisdom of Scripture? with the promptings, the insights, the intuitions that you have in your life? Are you willing to embrace humility and say, you know what, I don't know how to get where I'm going. I am willing to ask for help. Are you, are you the kind of person that will embrace courage? Because you're going to need that. You're going to need that if you're going to follow God. There are going to be times when 
your mind and your heart will tell you to step back and sit down. And yet the wisdom of Scripture and the whisperings of God are telling you to go forward. And if we learn to receive the guidance of God, we don't just wind up being in the right place at the right time. We wind up being the kind of person God intended us to be. Let's bow our heads this morning. I know that there are some people who, under the concept that they were seeking God's guidance, wound up being very irresponsible, um, couldn't really depend on them. They were one thing one day and one thing another day. And what I want you to know is, is that's not how God's guidance works. God's guidance doesn't make us less responsible. God's guidance doesn't make us more afraid. God's guidance grows and develops us in ways that help us realize who he's calling us to be in this world, and we get to see the difference that makes in the world around us. Our world is desperate for people who are sensitive to the guidance of God in their lives. That our world is in a very dark place and fear runs rampant. And there can be sons and daughters who learn to hear the whisperings of God's voice and access the wisdom of God's word. And they navigate life in a way that allows a light to shine in the darkness. So, Father, help us with this. Help us, for those of us who are a little bit too proud to ask for directions or acknowledge that we need help, would you, would you allow us to humble ourselves today? For those of us who are fearful and step back, would you give us a little courage today? We're not asking for you to make everything easy and comfortable. We're asking for the meaningful life you called us to. We trust you for that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together.